motivated in this talk uh, by the fact that commitment devices uh, have played an expanding role in trying to help people with their self-control problems. Uh, so, and, I, and so I think we see this in lots of domains. Uh, there's lots of people in this room that have done work on this. This is, uh, of course, a very, very small sampling. But we see examples in commitment savings, uh, smoking cessation, weight loss, exercise. Uh, researchers are using this as a tool in their tool belt to help people with self-control problems. And, and private markets are, are um, helping individuals set commitment devices for themselves. Uh, uh, Todd Rogers and Katie and Kevin uh, uh, had an opinion piece just this year on, in JAMA that talked about the importance of commitment devices and how we need to think hard about how to use them and, and increase take up in these domains. Um, and, and I like all of this, uh, and I think there's good reason why we're using commitment devices, and, and primarily because we have a very nice set of theories that uh, that have become pretty well established, and there's a, there's a, there's a large amount of empirical evidence that, that kind of back these theories up. Uh, we're starting to understand how it works better, and the moderators here and everything. Uh, so, so, I think it's, uh, so I think it's for good reason that we're using this more and more as something that we can do to help people with their self-control problems. And in the talk today, uh, what we're interested in doing is thinking about the fact that there's another intertemporal bias of decision making, uh, specifically projection bias, that maybe one ought to also think about when implementing a commitment device. Rather than just thinking about present bias preferences, uh, projection bias might have something important to say in this domain as well. So we're going to flesh that out a little bit. So projection bias, of course, has been looked at um, by, by George. Uh, where did I lost George? Oh, the, yeah, by George a ton. Uh, uh, so there's more sites that could have gone on here. Don't even be fooled, even the et al's, he's usually in there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but in, in psychology, this is often kind of referred to as a hot, cold empathy gap or, or, or uh, work in visceral states. Um, and, and there's a large amount of evidence and it's starting to be fleshed out here as well. And, and there's, there's more kind of field evidence that's been coming out. And we have a nice theoretical framework uh, that, that George, Ted, and Matthew developed. Um, and so, so here's the intuition for how projection bias might play an important role in commitment decisions. And maybe many of you already have this intuition. But so if I think about my own life, um, I think if I had a perfect commitment device that I could have used at any moment, whenever I felt like I wanted to commit to something, I think my life would be awful. Right? I would have, um, at some moment when I was well rested and well fed, I would have committed to run 10 miles at 5 a.m. every morning for the rest of my life, right? Or uh, after I recently returned from a beach vacation, I would have committed to like hit the weight room every single morning, right? Because clearly that's what I needed, right? I recently drove home from a trip and I, my flight was, the flight was a mess, so I had to drive a rental car and I listened to acoustic music the whole way. When I got back, I told my wife I wanted to buy a guitar. <laughs> she's like, what? Said, she's like, well, we're going to play the guitar. I said, I don't know, I can make space. <laughs> and she asked me just the other, are you still thinking about guitar? Like, you know, got, I said, I've kind of lost interest in the guitar over the last few weeks. So I think this is, this is the exam, this is the in, in, intuition that I have, or at least we've uh, thought about for why we need to be thinking about projection bias and commitment to decisions. And there's also evidence, which is suggested, because there's other things that could be going on, but there's a lot of failed attempts uh, at commitment, uh, in, for commitment contracts. So if you go back, so for example, the smoking cessation study, uh, these people in the Philippines put down, on average, 20% of their monthly income, and far more than half never fulfilled their commitment and lost that money, right? Now, uh, so, so, and, you know, oftentimes we have ellipticals in our basements and different things where one could think of those as types of commitment devices. So I think we have evidence that sometimes commitment devices can go, can go wrong, and, and this projection bias could be one of the leading explanations for this. All right, so what are we going to do today? I want to uh, go through a simple model that combines beta delta with projection bias to think about exactly what the predictions are here. And then we're going to test for the impact of projection bias on demand for commitment in, in arguably a kind of a fun, innovative setting. I think this, so the empirical uh, setting will be kind of interesting to talk through. Uh, maybe it's a little bit too innovative. I'll, I'll show you what we find. Let's start with this simple model. Now, you might say, well, it's pretty obvious. If you're satiated, 
uh, and you're in a you know, well-rested, fed state, then you're going to be more likely to commit. That's kind of the intuition that I led with. And I think in general that's right, but let me explain why I think it's worth writing this down. So take the following intuition. Maybe I'm so well-rested and well-fed that I say, I don't need a commitment device. Right? I'm going to do just fine. Right? So that, I hope, hopefully that gives you a hint for how it's not it's not, it's not obvious without writing something down exactly which way these predictions are going to go. So let me show you what we've written down. This is very simple. So imagine a simple deterministic setting with no uncertainty for start. This is kind of the starting place where people will write down a model like this. Imagine in the first period uh, that an individual is hungry and can choose to eat an unhealthy food or not. And if they choose the unhealthy food, uh, they get some benefit B. Uh, and then in the second period, uh, the health cost associated with, the, with what they chose in period one is realized. So if they ate the unhealthy food and received B in period one, they're going to receive a cost C in period two. So let me show you. So we've got a simple number line here. We've got B. Here's, if you're a sophisticated beta delta person, this shows you that in period one, you think about your, the future costs associated with being unhealthy. You discount them by beta, right? And so if you have no commitment options, you're going to choose the unhealthy action if the benefit of choosing so is larger than the discounted cost associated with doing so. Right? Now, of course, the interesting case is when you're in between here, because as an outsider, your period zero self would say, ah, you know, B was actually less than C, so maybe I probably shouldn't have done it, but I, in the moment I couldn't help myself because this beta kicked in. Right? So this is kind of the typical setup. So let's add commitment to this. So imagine that in period zero, you're offered a chance, you're, you're offered an amount of money M, and you, you can either have that money for sure in period two, or you can make it conditional on your behavior in period one. You can say, I only get that money if I do the healthy option. So now what happens when you're, when you're given this commitment to, um, option, if B, if B is larger than C, you still don't want to commit, right? Because it doesn't make sense to. You would, you're, you're going to prefer uh, to just have, do the unhealthy thing in period one, and that's better than the cost of period two. If you're in this middle range, then you do want to commit as long as M is large enough to force yourself to actually do so, right? So uh, as long as M is large enough, I'm going to commit myself, and then I'm going to choose the healthy option. And if you're in this setting, uh, on, to the left of here, now you already know that you're going to do the healthy option, so you're kind of indifferent about the commitment. Either way, you're going to get that money in period two, whether it's conditional on being healthy or not, because you're going to choose the healthy option. All right, so those are our kind of three situations you could fall in. All right, so now we have our commitment kind of model set up. So now we want to add projection bias. So let me give the intuition for what this does. <coughs> so a natural way to add projection bias is to assume that in period zero, you could be in one of two states. You could be in a hungry state, or you could be in a full state. And this is going to change. You're going to project something into your, onto your period one state. And we think the most natural way to do this is to think about the, the <laughs> benefit that you think you're going to get from eating that unhealthy food is going to change depending on your perceived benefit is going to change depending on the state you're in in period zero. All right, so if I'm in a hungry state, I think that the benefit of eating that food in period one is going to be higher than if I'm in the full state. All right? And so now how would you actually, what would be your demand for commitment um, across these two different states? So let me show you the three cases that kind of matter. So imagine in the full state, your perceived benefit of, of, uh, your perceived benefit of eating unhealthy in period one is here. And then in the hungry state, it's pushing you this way. Because right? now it seems like the, perceived, the benefit is going to be higher for eating that cake, because I'm in this craving state already. You are going to, in this case, have a, a, a decreasing demand for commitment as you get into this craving state, uh, if you kind of aggregate over possible M's, because now it's going to take a larger M for you to want to do it. The, the further you get this way, the larger the amount of money is going to have to be to actually commit, because there's less value for the commitment. And so it's going to have to be pretty large in order to force your future self to do it. Right, so as we're moving this way, it's unambiguous that you're going to be less likely to commit uh, for, for a range of M's here than for here. Now imagine this case. Imagine you were full here and hungry pushes you over this line. Well now, if you push over this line, you don't want to commit at all when you're in the hungry state. Now you think, no, it doesn't even make sense to commit. 
So there is going to be some commitment here if the m is large enough, but here you don't want to commit at all. So again, it's unambiguous that as, as you get hungry, you're going to be more likely to commit. Now here's one interesting case. What if you start here where you're indifferent about committing in the full state, but now that you're hungry, now you actually do want to commit if the m is large enough. So here it's unclear, it's ambiguous what the prediction is because we don't know what people are going to do when they're indifferent. So one thing that we can use to, to, to kind of try to overcome this is imagine if there was a commitment plus a bonus, something to break the indifference. So we say, you know, you commit and then you get a bonus as well if you reach your commitment. That's going to just break the tie. Now all of these people are going to commit because might as well, they're going to get a bonus. And then these people are going to only commit if M is large enough. So again, we have an unambiguous prediction if we have commitment plus a bonus on the likelihood of committing and you're going to commit less as you get into the more hungry state. All right, so you can, you can kind of graph what this might look like over M under certain assumptions and different things, but the, but the punchline is you're going to have increase in commitment as the amount of the commitment is, goes up, and there's going to be this separation between the full and the hungry state where you're more likely to commit when you're satiated uh, and full. And so these are the predictions that come out. Now we can, this model could become um, a lot less simplified. So for example, uh, there's different choices one could make. One could argue that projection bias works through beta half instead of beta, right? And, and we think that most of these results kind of go through in that situation. One could also add different things to the model. For example, one could add some uncertainty, which is an important aspect in, in this commitment device stuff. So imagine uh, that your perceived uh, B is actually some distribution around this. Now, if you think through the three cases, uh, we're still in the process of kind of fleshing this out, but if you think through the three cases, it does seem like the further you are to the right, uncertainty makes it even less likely that you're going to want to commit. Uh, so so uh, we can see kind of how generalizable these results are to different assumptions we want to add, but, but the starting point is this looks like the direction that it's going to go in, in, in the most uh, simple form to this model. So, let, oh, I, actually, I do want to show one last slide, though, uh, on welfare, which is, for me, is even more scary than modeling sometimes. And, and that's, you'll notice the length of the slide. Um, we're not going to really say much about welfare here. Um, there's a lot of complicated issues that one could try to think about. Um, it's not clear which commitment is right, uh, making it in the cold versus the hot state. There is one thing, though, that's unambiguous. Someone's wrong. Right? Someone is not optimizing. It can't be the case that they're both right. Um, and, and that's the point that we're really trying to drive home here is that someone's making a mistake here and we can think hard about the welfare and kind of how we might change to make this uh, an environment where people are less likely to make mistakes. Uh, but someone's making a mistake and so we need to be thinking about it. Okay, so let me show you the empirical uh, strategy and results. So what we're going to do is we're going to experimentally manipulate hunger and tobacco craving. Um, and then we're going to use hypothetical commitment decisions to test the predictions of the model. We're going to do this on, on Amazon's Mechanical Turk, uh, which you may be thinking, what? How in the world would you ever do something like this on Amazon Mechanical Turk? Um, you might be right. So, so, <laughs> do you, on, so everyone knows Amazon Mechanical Turk is this online participant sample, right, that you can use to, to have them kind of do these little studies and things. Now, there's going to be a trade-off here. We're going to lose a lot of experimental control by going to this setting. Uh, but the nice thing is we're going, to, we're going to drastically improve our sample size. So I'm going to show you that we're going to have you know, sample size kind of an order of magnitude larger than most of the studies that are in this area. So there's going to be this trade-off, and we'll talk about this. But, but here's how we did it. So we recruited for two different hits on Amazon Mechanical Turk. One is a smoking one, and one's a food. We ended up attracting 633 people who completed the smoking hit. Um, here are the restrictions. They had to be 18 years or older. They had to be a current smoker. They had to have two cigarettes in their possession and be willing to smoke them when we told them to. <laughs> they had to have a camera and be willing to upload a picture of their face with a lit cigarette in their mouth um, at a given point in the survey. And they received for this a $10 payment for a 30-minute task plus a 15-minute survey. So that's how it was advertised. Uh, for the food hits, very similar, but they had to have a candy bar in their possession. Um, and we, we attracted 918 people for this. They were also paid $10 for a 60-minute task plus a 15-minute survey. So here's how exactly the study design went. So when, when they agreed to participate, the, the participants answered 10 to 15 kind of demographic and smoking or dieting related questions on the front end. 
And then we very quickly wanted to make sure that they were going to be able to actually do the things we needed them to do in the experiment. We wanted to make sure that they had their cigarettes or their candy bar. So participants were asked to upload a picture of themselves with two unlit cigarettes in their mouth with their worker ID number written in place below their chin uh, on a piece of paper. So in, and in the candy bar condition, they had to have a picture of the candy bar with uh, their worker ID on a piece of paper. Right? So they couldn't get these photos from online. And we, so we have 633 pictures of people's faces <laughs> with their worker ID number that match up right, with cigarettes that we could see. All right? so, uh, so, so they did that. They uploaded that. And once that's confirmed, now they can move on in the study. Subjects were told, please don't eat the candy bar or smoke the cigarettes until we tell you at a given point in the survey. Uh, then they, they took off to do this either 30 or 60 minute task. And the task was pretty, pr pretty awful. Um, they had descriptive, <laughs> like loading up pictures wasn't awful enough, right? Um, but they had 30 or 60 minutes to describe photos. Um, and this was just a filler task. We were wanting to create time. We didn't know how long it had been necessarily that they hadn't eaten or smoked going in. We wanted to create some buffer. We also thought, well, we might as well use some cues. So we had the smokers describe pictures of people smoking. And we said, pay particular attention to where you place the cigarettes in your mouth. We kind of try to throw them off the scent, maybe, uh, uh, and, then, and then when we took pictures of them with the cigarettes in their mouth, we talked about make sure to place them where you would normally smoke. So they're kind of thinking about location in the mouth and different things. Uh, for, the, for the food people, they saw pictures of people eating food, and they had to write descriptions of these pictures as well. So they did this for 30 minutes, and then they were allowed to go on, and then that's when the randomization occurred. They were either asked to smoke the cigarettes and again upload a picture of themselves with the lit cigarettes smoking, um, or they were asked to eat the candy bar. And they were told to write down, put the empty wrapper, take a picture of it with your worker ID number and the number of chews it took uh, to eat the candy bar. We wanted them to eat the whole candy bar. We wanted them to think it was about chews. So, so they did that. Um, and then, so once, they, once, once we got them in the cold state, uh, then we asked them 10 questions, uh, exactly 10 questions, and I'll show you what those are. Um, and then, of course, the other randomization is they were asked the 10 questions first, and then they did the smoking or eating. All right? So we're going to be looking whether they were, had just smoked or they were about to smoke on how they answered these questions. All right, so what are the questions that we asked? Well, the first is just a simple manipulation check. Um, so we asked, how strong is your desire to smoke a cigarette right now? And how hungry are you right now on a scale from one to seven? Um, and uh, we do this and we, we simply look at this by treatment condition. Um, I, I haven't shown the summary statistics. Um, I have them at the back. They're balanced across the conditions. So Qualtrics kind of randomly did a good job randomizing everything. But you find a, a strong manipulation effect. So those that hadn't smoked said that their desire for a cigarette was much higher uh, than those that had just smoked. And those that had just eaten a candy bar uh, had lower hunger than those that hadn't eaten yet. Right? So these are very strong effects. So the manipulation seems to have worked. Now, is it possible that they're just playing with us? That they never really ate the candy bar when we told them to, or they never smoked when we told them to, but they kind of knew that they needed to answer in this way to make it seem like they ate the candy bar? So those are some of the experimental control questions that we, that we lose by going to this sample. Now, I'll tell you, it, it seemed as if people were very uh, were very careful uh, in what they did, right? So, I mean, the, the number of emails of, yeah, can I use a Nutrigame bar instead of a candy bar? <laughs> I, mean, there, I mean, there was a lot, they, they seem motivated to kind of get it right and they care about their rating that we're gonna rate them at the end of the experiment. And so my, I was super, super impressed with the quality that it seemed to come out of this, but, but I don't know for sure exactly uh, what the experimental control was like uh, in, in all of these cases. Um, okay, so we've got these manipulation checks. So the next thing, the next three questions were essentially, um, I should have mentioned this from the very start. Uh, this entire experiment is, is a very modest extension of work that's already been done by George and, and Lauren Nordgren. Um, and we're, we're essentially extending it just to try to pick up now on commitment devices, where other questions that are somewhat similar have been asked. So for example, uh, in the previous literature, there's questions that put people in these different states and then simply ask them, how hard would it be to quit smoking, right? Or how do you think you could do it? How likely could you, uh, is it that you could stop smoking within the next month or something? So what we did is we wanted to replicate those earlier results. And we did so using three questions that were used in these other studies. 
the first question is, how difficult would it be for you to not smoke at all tomorrow? All right, so a very simple question on a scale from one to seven. And we don't find significant evidence of a difference here. Uh, so uh, we would expect that if you had already smoked, it would seem very easy for you. Um, and, and if you hadn't smoked yet, it would seem very hard because you're in a craving state. We do find evidence slightly in that direction, uh, but not strong evidence. And we can, uh, we can easily kind of reject point estimates from, from the previous work. Um, let me show you these other two questions. So one is, uh, how difficult would it be for you not to smoke at all next month? Again, we find no evidence of differences here. And then lastly, how likely is it that you will have quit smoking in one year? And here, we find it in the right direction, but again, not significant. Now, there are several cuts that one could do with this, right? So uh, we could cut it to people that are wanting to quit smoking or have, uh, you know, uh, high efficacy measures. Right? We could do all, we could do, I don't know if that made sense. Uh, we could do lots of different things. Um, and we, and we, we did do some cuts and try to understand the data better. And, and it's possible you could get maybe marginal significance in some cases, but it's never very robust. And, and it's always, it's easier to probably make this effect go away even more than it is to try to enhance it somehow more by using natural cuts that one might think would make sense. All right, so I'm going to come back in just a minute and talk about maybe why some of these effects are coming this way. And I'll be, of course, interested in your feedback as well. Um, this is a little bit discouraging. We're thinking of this as almost kind of a first stage, right? We're just trying to show evidence of projection bias. And then we want to see if people are really kind of in this projection bias, if this is having the predictions that we would predict on commitment decisions. Um, and we're not even kind of finding this first stage. But let me show you what the commitment questions look like anyway. So, um, so we, had, we had six questions that we then asked about commitment. So, so three of them look just like this, and the, the amount changed. So we said, imagine that we promised to give you $20 in one month. And we change this from either $20 or $200 or $2,000. So we varied the level of the commitment. Um, as an added bonus, uh, we'll give you this money as an added bonus for participating in our experiment. Imagine we also had a, had a way to determine if you had been smoke free until that date. Suppose we gave you the option to receive the $20 for sure or to receive the $20 only if you did not smoke. The latter option may help motivate you to quit smoking. Would you prefer to receive the $20 for sure or to only receive the payment if you are smoke free? Right, so it's just a very simple commitment. They can commit to, uh, to, to have that money be <coughs> conditional and that might help them uh, not smoke. So in the, they haven't smoked yet condition, so they're in the craving condition. This is what we, what we find. So first of all, we find strong evidence of a desire for commitment. Right? This again goes back to the idea that this is, could be a very important tool to help solve some of these self-control problems. It's upward sloping, which is consistent with kind of our prediction that the more that, you're, that you can commit, the, actually the more likely you would want to do it. Um, and now I'm going to show you on top of this what the uh, condition was when you had, uh, you didn't smoke yet, uh, you had just smoked, right? So now you're in the full state. And remember, our prediction is that that's going to be higher uh, because now you're satiated. So you think for all of these various reasons that we went through, you're going to be more likely to accept any commitment device. Um, so here's what we find. Now it's tantalizing. Uh, these are standard error bars, not considerable. So this isn't more, uh, significantly different from each other. Now, you might say, well, I don't know. It's kind of looking like what that earlier graph looked like. And in fact, if you look at the effect size, it's not that they're, they're small. So we find uh, maybe a 25% willingness to commit here and then a 30% willingness to commit. That's a 20% increase, right? A 5 percentage point increase or a 20% increase. I think those are reasonable effect sizes. Um, I mean, but we're just not powered to pick up that kind of effect size. In fact, we're, we're not powered even close. We are, you know, a key stat there would be about one. So in order to kind of find a significant effect, we'd have to increase our sample size by an order of magnitude. So we'd have to go from 600 to 6,000 smokers, uh, which would be you know, tens of thousands more dollars and very hard to find. I think we were uh, almost capped out on people that would upload a photo of, of smoking and things. Um, so it's a reasonable effect size, but we're just not powered to pick up that type of effect size. Um, and and so, so, so that's what we find there. Let me show you what we find for the smoking, or for the food case. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I do that, the other three questions is, remember there's this bonus idea. 
that one reason why we might not get an unambiguous prediction is because they need a bonus when they're in the uh, when they're in, if, if they happen to be in the state that they think they're, they're going to fulfill no matter what. So in this case, all we did is we say, uh, suppose we gave you the option to receive the $20 for sure or to receive, the, or to receive $30 if you did not smoke. Uh, so the latter option may help motivate you to quit smoking. Would you prefer to receive the 20 for sure or only to receive the payment and the additional $10 bonus if you are smoke free? All right, so we just provide a bonus. By the way, we randomize these questions. Uh, so we, I'm showing you the, I'm showing you the within uh, estimates, but we could restrict to the first response that each one gave and show you the between and they look similar. Um, so, so here's with the bonus condition and here we see again uh, in the if you hadn't smoked yet condition and kind of marginally higher but definitely not significant uh, <laughs> if they were in the satiated state. All right, let me now. Yes, please. Does the bonus also scale when you scale up the, the No, it was a $10. I don't know so what you mean by scale. $10 on 2,000 versus $10 on 20. Yeah, which might explain why this isn't quite as upward sloping if there's some percentage thinking or something going on here. We, we talked about whether to have it scale uh, percentage-wise or not. But um, so, so all right, so again, now let me show you the food situation. So here is the willingness to commit uh, to, to lose weight over the next month. And so again, we would expect now if, if you're in the satiated state, it's going to be higher. In this case, we find lower. Right? So when you may have been a little, a tantalized by those earlier evidence here, you know, we're finding uh, uh, in the opposite direction now. Um, and so we consistently kind of don't find any clean evidence of a difference in willingness to commit uh, based, on, uh, based on the treatment that broke. OK, so let me, let me wrap up. Um, uh, in, in these last two minutes with, with two thoughts. So first is, um, let me talk about a couple of possible explanations for why we didn't find evidence in this situation. I think there are a couple of good reasons um, that, that it might not have popped out. So one is it could just be these effects are pretty small and, and pretty subtle and we were just able to capture them with our treatment and our sample size. Um, it could be that our lack of experimental control resulted in non-compliance uh, by these individuals. And that's a hard one for us to test. It could just be that this is a weird sample um, and, and they just weren't very compliant. Um, another thing that we, that we in, uh, ex post have thought about that we were pretty worried about is we didn't give very much time separation between the satiation and the questions. I mean, they could have just finished that last bite of their candy bar. Now they're moving on and answering this next question about, you know, how much would you like to not eat a candy bar tomorrow? And and yeah, we're, our prediction is that they're in a satiated case state, and so they're going to say, oh, yeah, I don't need a candy bar tomorrow. But it could be that they just realized how great it is to satisfy their hunger. Uh, and so, man, I, I want to satisfy this again tomorrow. Right? So, so that's one. And in these other studies, there was a bit more separation than we find in ours. So that's one potential explanation as well that, uh, that we've thought about for why uh, we failed to kind of replicate earlier results. Uh, but again, we're open to your, uh, to your thoughts as well. So let me just conclude by, by saying, uh, in this paper, I think we've combined these two models and we're thinking about commitment devices with both intertemporal biases that, that are kind of on people's radar in mind. And I think the, the theory suggests that these have important predictions that, that can be testable and the projection bias could result in non-optimizing behavior in a commitment device situation. And I think for us at least, future directions include thinking about the robustness of these models when, when expanding them to, to more uh, complicated forms and also uh, to try to understand this null result. And we're, we're thinking about whether to try this again in a situation where we have more experimental control, uh, sitting outside a restaurant or just doing it in the lab, um, uh, or potentially with real commitment devices, uh, real commitment decisions as well.